Hey gang, um, I just want to give some vision, history, and practical advice about fasting today. My name is Ryan. I'm one of the pastors here on staff at the Vineyard. And we talked about on Sunday, um, the staff, the board, and myself, we've just been feeling a corporate call to fast as a church over the past few months. And I got the sense late last year, and as I sat on it, ruminated, and prayed, and started inviting others into it. We all thought that maybe the Lord was saying something to us, and we want to be a church that responds to the Lord. And so we started talking about a corporate fast. And I was unsure as to why, but over the last few months, it's become very evident as there's a lot of situations that people are facing in our church and their families with the gender the gender identity stuff, with the uh, um, crazy things going on in the world, a lot of illnesses people have been facing. We have a lot of people that are facing a lot of events, and we just, we want to be a church that experiences continuous breakthrough, and we wanted to um, just press into heaven, and one of the ways that we see in the Bible, in the Old and and New Testament, is when people are seeking breakthrough from God, and uh, clarity, and uh, direction, that they fast. And we've seen in the last couple of days even, we decided this last week there was something we were going to go forward with, and then all hell broke loose in the vineyard nationwide, and then in Asia and in Europe last week also. Um, so why a group fast? First of all, I think uh, we're better together. It makes us one mind. And when we unify and pray, Jesus says, when two or more gather in my name and pray, that I'm there. And so if he's there with two or more, I mean, what if hundreds of us uh, do it together? And we want to unify around the call of God together as a church. So what is fasting? Throughout the Bible, fasting refers to abstaining from food or maybe even water for a period of time for spiritual purposes. Like I said, of breakthrough, of uh, repentance, of just seeking. And it's not camping out on a billboard for 31 years till the Bengals win a playoff game, or it's not a protest. It's a prayer, and it's a praise posture. Biblical fasting always centers on us receiving God's purposes and directives for the church. We see in the Bible, in both Matthew and Luke chapters 4, that Jesus fasted for 40 days. We also know um, from the Talmud and some other um, other. Uh, sources that the Pharisees fasted 21 days prior to their entering in the public ministry as a rabbi or a church leader. And the Didache prescribes two days of fasting per week for the Jewish leaders and on Wednesday and Friday. And this was a uh, practice also revived by the early Methodists in the mid to late 1700s. What fasting is not, it's not a commandment. It's not an obligation to partake in. It's a way to prepare us for endurance in the last days. It's a way to connect our hearts to the Lord, and it's a way for us to repent. That's a very physical way. Say, Lord, I'm giving up something that I need to get what you want me to have. And we focus a lot of times more on false doctrine or of escape and on the rapture than we do patiently persevering for the Lord's answering of our prayer. And I think that fasting is a pretty unpopular thing in our culture. Actually, there was one author who looked up books on fasting in the English language, and from 1861 to 1954, he couldn't find any that were published. Very interesting. Um, And I think that in a culture of golden arches and Starbucks and cookie and candy shops and pizza palaces and, you know, just entire networks dedicated to food that were a culture that wouldn't be very into fasting, that we wouldn't talk about very much because it's very countercultural not to indulge here in the West. Fasting in the Bible generally consists of individuals or an entire nation laying down physical needs for breakthrough for their spiritual needs, as I just said. Jesus teaches about fasting in the Sermon on the Mount. He teaches about it along with giving and praying. He says, when you fast, So it's almost implicit in Matthew 6, 16, that born again people would fast. His idea was not, um, his idea was not to reject or to despise fasting. His intention was to restore proper fasting. Martin Luther once said this. And that's what Jesus did. Jesus didn't, um, we see in the Bible, we don't see him blowing up the Pharisees and the leaders for some of their practices, but it was the heart behind it. So we want to fast for the right reasons. 
We're not fasting to get to God. We're not fasting to prove something, but we're fasting so God can get to us. And more than any other Christian discipline in my experience, fasting reveals what controls us. We can often cover up what's inside of us by the immediate comforts of food and drink and other good things. But fasting has a way to bring these things to the surface, like the term hangry. Anyone ever get really mad when you're hungry or really irritable or agitated? No, you're not mad because you're hungry. You're mad because you got an anger problem, or you're mad because you have an impatience problem, or you're mad because you got an impulse control problem. And that's what fasting reveals, even sometimes meal to meal. And really, we use food as a way to control how we feel, often. Every time that food touches our tongues, we can control it. And we're saying to Jesus, Lord, I'm giving up control to my life and turning my entire body, soul, mind, and heart over to you. So like I said, we're fasting for breakthrough in our own lives, our families, our church, our churches, our nation, and in the world. Psalm 69, Ted said, I humbled myself with fasting. David said that. And at first, we may rationalize on a bunch of levels why we shouldn't do it. But if we look at the Bible, we see very few reasons that we shouldn't do it. And we see a lot of reasons to do it. A great quote that I saw in fasting. In fasting, we are not as much abstaining from food as we are feasting on the Word of God in prayer. Richard Foster says this in his timeless classic, Celebration of Discipline. That we're fasting on the Word of God in prayer. And that leads me to one of the practical points, that when we're fasting at times when we would be eating, we replace that eating of food with a time of repentance, a time of prayer, a time of introspection from the Lord and the Word. And we say, Jesus, show us what you want us to know. And we tend to be creatures of uh, polarity, either or sort of folks. In the landscape, like I said, of all these different food options, we tend to be like either indulging our food or not eating at all. Like we have to stay away from everything or we just consume all we can. So why is fasting so chided? John Wesley said, some have exalted religious fasting above all scripture and reason, and others have utterly disregarded it. Like I said, opposite poles. And I can tell you amongst Christian workers that there is nothing that I get more pushback on than the subject of fasting. Interesting that all three things are one and the same, but different facets of the call of God towards the abnegation of ourselves. Jesus invites us to come and die, in a sense. He said, if any man comes after me, must deny himself and take his cross and follow after me. And that word man there means person. So any man, woman, child who wants to come after God needs to give up their right to themselves for what he wants to do. And fasting is a way we do that. It's just like giving. It's just like tithing. It's just like Sabbath, that there's something that when we die to some of our rights, our time, our talent, our treasures, we say we want your kingdom more than we want what we want. And so, um, we want to be a place that not fo- we don't want to focus on the excess or on the, or on the malnourishment. We want to be a place that's balanced at Florence Vineyard. We want to be anchored in the Word. We want to walk in the Spirit. We want to be heavenly-minded and earthly good. And we know a way that we can be heavenly-minded and earthly good is fasting. Actually, there's a lot of things. There's a lot of research. I looked, looked yesterday for videos on fasting uh, like online and YouTube. I had to scroll for five minutes before I saw one Christian video on fasting. And in that five minutes, I only saw one. I saw tons of uh, gurus and fitness, and fitness uh, you know, ninjas or doctors talking about the benefits of fasting. So if you're really worried about fasting for a week, there's lots of spiritual and physical benefits of fasting. Uh, In 1996 or 97, I believe, New England Journal of Medicine published some findings on fasting, and they showed that actually a annual week-long fast had amazing results for human bodies to flush out minerals and excessive metals and impurities and toxins. So we're talking about something that not only could have amazing spiritual results, but physical results. And we want what God wants for us. We want what God has for this church. Now you might say, well, I have some physical limitations where I can't fast, or if I don't have certain amounts of sugar, 
well, do, do some research. Possibly you can get some of those from a shake or from a V8 or a glass of juice. We don't want anyone to injure themselves. And we're not demanding anyone does this. But we're saying if you physically can, if you don't have a physical impediment or a med, uh, medical condition that prevents you from it, we just ask you to pray about it. Why food versus Facebook or TV? I'm not saying you can't fast from those things, but what I'm saying is we don't need those things. The Bible only centers on food fasting because it's something we need to survive. And now those things might be good too. I felt recently like the Lord just told me to lay off the Bengals stuff. After the Super Bowl, I realized I was consumed, I was upset. And so I'm, not, I'm in a period where I'm personally, I'm not looking at Bengals stuff for 30 days. So, but I'm not going to count that in my seven-day fast is what I'm fasting for. I'm going to fast from food. And so there's a lot of spurious or audacious claims out there that you'll die, you'll die, it's bad for you. Like I just said, there's a lot of research actually that would show it's good for you. And so how do I start? Maybe start by intermittent fasting. There's a lot of research that intermittent fasting can help people lose weight, can regulate body chemistry, circadian rhythms, and other things. So maybe try over the next two weeks, try a couple days where maybe you fast for a 24-hour period from lunch to lunch or breakfast to breakfast or dinner to, to dinner or do intermittent fasting where maybe from 6 o'clock at night till 12 the next day you don't eat and then you just try to eat between 12 and 6. It's going to be hard. It's going to be hard at first. But I want you to know that you most likely will um, gain a lot more than you lose. Um, you can also try a Daniel fast between now and the 13th. Or maybe if you have health limitations, you just try a Daniel fast during our week-long fast. And a Daniel fast was in the book of Daniel, chapter 10, verse 3. He said he ate no delicacies, meat, or wine entered himself, nor did he, uh, he anoint himself with any oils or lotions. So what that means is during the seven-day period, you would uh, commit that you don't eat anything except for fresh fruits, fresh vegetables, and drink water that you would say, I'm not going to drink coffee or alcohol or juices or whatever. I'm just going to cleanse my system. And you can get a lot of good effects that way physically and spiritually. And we encourage you, whatever the Lord's calling you to, to fast. And so there were absolute fasts in the Bible where they did nothing but water for a duration of time. We see this in Esther chapter 4. Paul did this in Acts chapter 9 verse 9. Moses and Elijah did 40-day food fast. Deuteronomy 9, 1 Kings 19. Um, and so, like I said, there's a lot of biblical evidence and precedent for fasting. There was whole days and holidays dedicated to fasting. For days of national repentance, emergency need, we see this in Joel 2, 2 Chronicles 20, Ezra chapter 8, and the list goes on. So I'm not going to try to convince you. If you feel compelled, I want you to know that we're doing this together as a church, and we're inviting everyone to do it with us as a staff and board and as leadership and just anyone who calls Florence Vineyard home. Or maybe you're just a born-again person who's like, man, I just stumbled upon this place and I'm checking it out, but I want what Jesus wants. Jump in. Jump in with us. So a couple practical tips. Don't get too caught up in the physical benefits of it. Stay off the scale. Keep your motivation on hearing from heaven and on breakthrough. Don't worry about your waistline decrease. No, that'll be a benefit, but um, don't focus on that. And days one and three in the fast are typically the hardest. You can get headaches, you can get shakes. Would encourage you, if you're not going to be drinking caffeine during the fast, to stop it three or four days before your fast so you're not dealing with some of the physical things that come with not eating food on top of a bad headache. So in many ways, our stomachs are like spoiled children. They need discipline more than they need indulgence. So ignore the, the, the spoiled child vibes of hunger pangs and the psychological aspects of the fast. You can make it. You can do it. Call someone from the church. Call me, email, text, jump on Instagram. Tell your success story. Say, I need prayer. I want to eat. We want to do this together. Master your belly and your tongue. Bible says you're a slave to whatever controls you. Don't let your belly, don't let your appetite control you. That's one of the things we want breakthrough. We know we live a culture, in a culture of indulgence. We know a lot of people are addicted or controlled by a lot of things. And this is the first step to breaking through. And your body can feel dizzy as you start to purge toxins. You might feel sick, dizzy, or weak the first couple of days. But, and you also know maybe a coating on your tongue or bad breath. Don't be upset. 
rejoice. You are gaining some ancillary physical benefits from this fast and rejoice when you suffer. That's a lost art. And in the American church, that a lot of times doesn't look any different than the world. We can rejoice because Lord, we are suffering and we're asking for your kingdom to come just like Jesus did, just like the apostles did. Nextly, go without drawing attention. Don't tell everyone you're fasting. Jesus says, when you do this, do this in secret. Don't like walk around, I'm fasting, I'm going to be mad. Don't do that. Let people know in your church family or maybe in your household and beyond that, don't tell people unless there are other Christians and they want to join you. Maybe for someone to hold you accountable, but not to come across as a spiritual elite or some, you know, um, or some spiritual guru. Like I said, take time to fast on the word. Instead of eating times when you'd be eating at lunch, dinner, breakfast, whatever, break out your Bible and say, Lord, speak to me. Be my food. Let your word be my food. Jesus said to the disciples, I have food you know nothing about. And he's talking about the word of God. Pray for Christian brothers and sisters around the world who are in persecution, famine, refugee camps, torture, martyrdom, exile, separation from family, people in war. There's people in war zones that need our prayers, especially the family of faith. Ask for the gospel to break through. And don't worry about the physical stuff. Also, lastly, don't stock up before the fast. Don't be like, I'm going to eat 10,000 calories the day before a fast. Don't do that. You'll make it worse for yourself. Go into it slowly by eating less ahead of time. Ease into the fast instead of the opposite. And like I said, maybe um, towards before the fast and at the end, stock up on veggies. You don't want to be constipated. Sometimes when our systems have um, like adjustments, that can be the natural response. So eat a lot of veggies on either side, and that'll help you uh, feel better in your stomach, and it'll help help your body be healthier too. So um, feel free to hit me up with questions during or before the fast. We're going to celebrate this fast on Zoom. We're going to pray twice a day uh, together. We'll release that And you guys will have times and Zoom links where you can either come up to the church or else you can pray online with us. And then we're going to celebrate the ending of our fast with an all-church potluck following baptisms on Sunday, March 20th. So we're going to try to fast from March March 13th to March 20th. And uh, we're looking forward to it. We love you. We bless you. And we encourage you. This is going to be an exciting time of breakthrough for us individually and our families and as a church. I love you, Florence Vineyard family. Have a great day.